right, welcome everybody to the Monday, March 18th meeting of the Conway Select Board at 7 p.m. It will be the joint meeting of the Select Board and Finance Committee. This meeting is being recorded live by EPCAT and on Zoom for the town website. Um, if for any reason these recordings cease to function, we will continue with this meeting live and in person. So call the meeting to order. First item on the agenda, vote to approve the minutes of March 11th. Read them over, they all look good. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. It's unanimous. Um, so we'll skip over meetings attended by select boards and public comment. Well, I can't skip over public comment. So remember the public here to comment live on Zoom. All right. Um, new business. We have our annual update from our esteemed representative, Natalie Lane. Um, Hello. You are esteemed. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to ask Nick, Nick, we see that you're on the call, um, if you can just bear with us a little bit, but we're here, we're here with State Rep, Natalie Glade. Um, and Nick, we appreciate you being here, thank you. Yeah. No problem, thank you for inviting me. Sure. Sure. So. Yeah, this is just, you know, annually I take the opportunity to meet with all 17 select boards in the 1st Franklin District. Uh, Thanks to Corinne, who manages to somehow make that happen. It's really quite an extraordinary feat. Um, so this is just really an opportunity to touch base with you, see what's on your minds, see if there, there's anything that um, you know, I could be doing better or differently in the State House, and just gives us an opportunity to make sure we're checking in with each other. I mean, I, for, first of all, I want to, on behalf of the select board in the town of Conway, just you know, on the record, just express our gratitude for coming through for us. With the one, two, four, five, that was just, really that was just, we were able to make that, that happen. That was just so <laughs> huge. I can't even begin to describe how important that was for us. And um, now it'll, I think it, it, it hasn't sunk into a lot of the residents just how meaningful that is, how even though we got, a th we had to, regretfully ask for authority to borrow 1.5 million last year. We're not going to be having to actually borrow that money, which will have a wonderful impact on people's taxes. Yeah. Um, and uh, just, uh, yeah, so just thank you. Yeah, well, I was happy that we were able to make that happen and want to thank MassDOT too. I mean, MassDOT came through for, for Conway and Deerfield. Mm -hmm. All of the towns impacted by the summer storms yeah. in a really tremendous way. So we were very lucky to have them as partners yeah. in that, that repair work. And MassDOT is continuing to come through for us too. It's an ongoing thing. Yeah. They're, they're good. I think uh, they would like budget increases for them too. District One needs a budget increase. <laughs> they, they made sure to let me know that. Um, well, just today they could we do were even <laughs> more. But their funding for District One has been relatively stagnant. They want more. They 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 could, they could help us even more. Yeah. we actually um, invited the secretary, the secretary of transportation, out today. You'll see this like, probably tomorrow in the reporter. Um, and she brought her entire team out to Greenfield, uh, including rail and transit, uh, the highway administrator, and it really, her team filled up the entire room, which was extraordinary to have Just, her. Is this the profile? It was at FERCOG today. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's posted on uh, FCAT. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, so it was a really constructive meeting. She, it turns out, is from a small rural town in northern Indiana. So, you know, we spent about an hour at the COG outlining, uh, outlining the really specific challenges that we're seeing here in Franklin County and the opportunities around you know, highway, rail, uh, supporting our regional transit authorities. Um, gravel, we were, gravel roads. Gravel roads. We were able to talk about culverts. Um, and we did have the opportunity after the formal meeting at the COG to tour around on an FRTEA bus. So we went through Greenfield up in along a gravel road uh, into Coleraine and back down. And I actually, one of the things I talked to the secretary about was the state's maintenance of culverts. Because what we saw here in Conway you know, where the, the, co the culverts weren't big enough, and as a result of that, it resulted in the significant damage along 116 and all of those driveways and, and 
people's homes um, along and, the way. And so. many of our town roads too. That yeah. was really one of the and also the fact that when the water goes through the culverts there's really no place for it to go. Yeah. Once, uh, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. There's culverts are I never would have thought that I'd be interested. <laughs> <laughs> We're all getting much more. It, it, it turns <laughs> out. It turns out so many times. <laughs> like, yeah, it turns out that that's like a really big deal. Yeah. Um, it really is. They are. You know, Burkhog is doing a culvert study analysis you know, right now to look at culverts in Franklin County, um, and they are finding that many of them are undersized and need to be typically doubled or tripled in size. That those projects are costly to design, mm -hmm. they're costly to construct. Um, so that is something that we talked to the secretary about, is how can we be looking for funding um, for those culverts. And for, we'll see what we can do with the unpaved roads. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I introduced a bill to begin to look at unpaved roads, since so many of our communities have such a high percentage of their total roadway mileage that is unpaved. Um, and there seems to be a recognition from this administration that this is a problem <laughs> for rural communities because this administration has been so tuned in to rural communities, uh, including establishing the director of rural affairs. Um, so they might take a look at what's included in the bill in terms of deliverables and see if MassDOT can just do them. Uh, just take that on without us having to pass legislation to establish a commission. Mm -hmm. You know, can MassDOT just direct some some time and some resources there so that we can get that additional information. Um, and we are seeing results from this administration in terms of funding, too. Um, the governor's H-2 budget includes a set aside of $24 million for rural roads. Uh, that is incredible, and that's from the fair share amendment. So we'll see what happens as the House goes through its budget process, um, which is happening right now. Tomorrow I'm chairing uh, Ways and Means budget hearing on judiciary and public safety in Worcester tomorrow. We need no judge in our county. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I think there's one more general you know, that Ways and Means budget hearing is open to the public after that. And then on April 10th, the House budget comes out. So we're coming right up to that. Is there any discussion on changing um, some of the uh, being able to build back better, like instead of having to replace a 12 inch with a 12 inch, mm -hmm. you can upgrade, is that mm -hmm. going through? I mean, I think that, so for the natural disaster relief fund that we put forward, um, have, I imagine that will be a topic of conversation tomorrow because it is proposed to be managed by administration and finance and NEMA you know, together in consultation with one another. Um, so I, I am guessing that we'll see a conversation tomorrow about that, uh, but the idea uh, behind it is that we don't just build it back the way that it failed, <laughs> you build it back so that we don't see that sort of failure happening again. Um, at least that is certainly the, the intent of Senator Comerford and I's bill, and I think the administration has taken that, and I know the administration has taken that same point of view. So one, one of the, I know that's a bill that we keenly hope yes. gets passed. And, um, but it's also a bill where the devil's going to be in the details mm -hmm. because um, the criteria that they are going to be using to awarding funds is really, really important to us. And what, what we have been, what I know I've been beating this drum for a while, mm -hmm. is um, to have one of the criteria be the proportion of the damage, that you, the dollar value of the damage you get should be proportionate to your community's budget. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, the big towns are gonna suck up all the money because they're able to put so much more dollars on the board yeah. than we can. Yeah. Um, and um, the other part too is that if, if, they just, if they just go by what the current FEMA, MEMA criteria is, then those of us with gravel roads right. are really out of luck too. Yeah. And yeah, piggyback on that discussion. Uh, we had talked with uh, Senator Comerford about this as well, but being in a small town, there's a lot of challenges. Um, you know, people in Boston probably look at small towns as being numbers on spreadsheets. The issue that we're having with a lot of the funding, grants, Chapter 90, is the formulas that are used. In a town like this where you have fewer people, 
if there's a small handful of people that are wealthy, the right the averages are much different. So towns like us where we have we could have 1,500 people that are average or even poor, and then 10 that are mega rich. It's going to show that the average in the town is higher than it actually is. So I'm not sure why it hasn't been proposed or not pushed forward to say even to deduct half the 0.5% the, the of the highest pay from that formula to get a more accurate depiction of the actual town um, to uh, be able to apply, just apply for these grants or have a different Chapter 90 outcome yeah. would be huge. And in the past, the legislature has tinkered with that formula by adjusting the relative percentages of each of those factors, the one being the aggregate municipal income, the other being the aggregate property value, uh, property values, and uh, I forget what some of the other ones. But even just like a one or two percent change in those would really help us, and those would be revenue neutral. Um, so, I, so, so would yeah, be and we looked, you know, with Burkhoff's help, we did look at, you know, what it would, what the results would be for communities if we changed the formula a little bit versus what it would be if we went with, you know, the two hundred million in the existing formula for Chapter ninety, and then for anything above and beyond, like we just saw with the hundred million dollars that that is dedicated to roadway mileage, not the formula. And that really delivered for rural communities. Um, and I, and I think, I'm going from memory, but I think that that, going by roadway mileage actually ended up helping communities in a more significant way, helping rural communities in a more significant way. Um, but there was a conversation with the secretary who did say that we've relied on population numbers for too long when it comes to these formulas. Um, so there is there is there was a recognition in the room that you know, the way that these grants and these programs um, are administered and doled out really needs to be looked at, especially when it comes to rural communities. And that's, I mean, then, there, there seems to be consistent attempts to help rural communities out, but they rarely emerge from the sausage making process unscathed <laughs> um, and uh, you know and I saw just a couple of weeks ago that the, the rural education bill that's in committee that in committee it got stripped of much of its actual rural funding mm -hmm. um, they're still calling it the rural education yes. bill yeah but they took out the yeah. money that would help us. Yeah, so you know, I'm happy to speak to the rural schools bill. Uh, it's a piece of legislation that I offered the Senator Cummer forward. Um, and it did come out of committee pretty significantly changed. Um, it, it, is an, it is an ambitious piece of legislation. We, we knew that because it was incorporating as many of the 36 recommendations included in the rural schools report as we could. So we knew that it was ambitious to start with. Um, the fact that it was reported favorable out favorably out of committee at all was a win because a bill of that magnitude in its very first session um, can be sent to study and that sort of that can set you back for the next session so the fact that it was reported favorably out of committee was a good thing um, I think they're given what we're seeing right now at the, the state level in terms of budgets and we're, we're just not seeing any growth for FY25 is really putting us at, you know, we're having to just be very careful fiscally when we haven't seen the levels of growth that we've been seeing over the last couple, well, last many years. Um, so, you know, the committee looked at the bill and tried to move forward as many pieces as they could around funding, but creating new funds right now, given what we're seeing, these fiscally constrained times, you know, they had to take a look at that because the other thing that they don't want to do is establish a fund and then have to not fund it in a, in a, in a following year so that people come to rely on that funding and then it's, and then it's stripped away. That's, that's something we definitely don't want to be doing either. So, um, you know, talking with the chair, they did try to advance as many of those funding pieces as they could, um, but they couldn't get all of them. I mean, in retrospect, the November uh, capital gains 
estate capital gains and inheritance tax cuts don't really. Yeah, that wouldn't that didn't have anything to do with us not getting benchmarks because they haven't. Hey, how are you? Good to meet you. Yeah, but um, we'll be fighting for addition, you know, looking at school funding, just generally speaking in the budget. There are a number of um, recommendations that we'll put forward at the Ways and Means Committee hearing that we had at GCC on education. So we'll be looking at rural school aid and increasing that hopefully by at least another $10 million. We'll be looking at those school transportation reimbursements because we've heard from regional schools that in each of the instances where they had to renew their five-year contracts, they're seeing double-digit increases, percentage increases. Um, we'll also be looking at this inflation factor, which was raised, where it's right now around 1.3%. Yeah, percent, just brilliant. And if we really need to shift, probably be up around 3 or 4%. So that's another piece that we'll be looking at I, I sit on the regional schools caucus, so those we're trying to put forward a package of solutions that the house could consider in the FY25 budget to really help bring some money in. And like you know, like you know, I've been on the Frontier and Conway School Committee yeah. for 15 years now, and um, and one of the things that you've seen over time is just the growing disparity in the cost per student, the ability of communities to afford those costs, but we're at a place now where Frontier is 17000 something per student, and you're seeing cost per student in Eastern districts of 30000 yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that the state does not do, and that we as a district are unable to do, is uh, gather data about student outcomes like 5, 10, 15 years down the road student outcomes being how much money they're making. And, um, you know, in order to get any kind of legislation yeah, on some kind, on a, on a fairness argument that would close that gap um, beyond what we can afford with our property tax, 100% property tax base, we, we kind of need data that shows that there's a difference in student outcomes down the road. And surely, you would think that there would be, just if other districts are spending twice as much per student than us, and are able to offer so many more programs and so much more enrichment academically and otherwise. So, I mean, that I would love to see Desi be, be asked mm -hmm. to do a statewide survey on student outcomes 10, 20 years post-graduation. Um, and the one thing that I didn't mention in that, that list is minimum school, minimum student aid, uh, per pupil student aid. And you know, right now it's the governor's proposed thirty dollars per, per pupil. Uh, the house has historically brought that up to sixty, uh, but the recommendation uh, from many organizations across the Commonwealth has been that we bring that up to one hundred. So that's another piece that, that, yeah, that could provide that's really good. Funding. That that would really help. Yeah. Um, and you know th those types of things, student you know, reimbursement of transportation. I would trade percentages of annual revenue for long-term security in what the number is going to be. Yeah. Like those numbers are so important when we're building a budget, and it's such a great unknown from year to year that if we just had greater certainty, it would be so helpful. Yeah. Um, because so, so many of the things that we could do are sort of multi-year mm -hmm. things. But we're, we always do this like lurch from year to year. And it's, again, all these districts that can spend $30,000 a year don't have these issues. Um, so, but yeah, um, but I'm glad you're definitely, you're definitely aware of the student, of the school issues, and that is really important to us, because that's two. We just went through a 10-hour hearing yeah. on that. It's, it's two-thirds two thir <laughs> two thir of our budget. It's just, it's, 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 it's two-thirds of our budget. It's nuts. It's seven um, hours. Yeah, it was a seven hour hearing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that was really interesting. I love, that's one of the things I love most about being on the Ways and Means Committee is you know being able to participate in these budget hearings. You learn so much about every aspect of government. And you know, as members, we're able to ask questions very specific to what our rural uh, communities are, are facing. And 
that we're able to lift up uh, things like you know, rural school aid or you know, whatever it happens to be in, in terms of the secretary that's before us. So it was, yeah. it was a long day, but it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Then there's just a couple other things too. Um, so one is we, the last remaining dam on the South River, the, the thing that is keeping it from being wild from source to um, where it empties out in the deer field is the high dam in Conway, on the station road. It is a state-owned dam. Um, there's a significant number of people in town that would like to see that dam dam removed. We are unable to tackle that project or do anything about that as a town. First of all, we don't own it. Yeah. Um, the state does have a, DEP has a dam removal section, mm -hmm. and they have a fund, a very well-endowed fund, for dam removal. Um, we would love to see them starting something about that. There are thousands and thousands of tons of sediment that are, I mean, that's the obstacle, I would admit, well, yet the, when, they, when the dam comes down, something has to be done with that. Well, yeah. unless you're the utility on Connecticut River, you just get to flush it all down the river, but we wouldn't be able to do that. <coughs> um, so that would be, okay. that would be okay. really good. Yeah. And the other thing that actually, um, a family just came, brought this to my attention today, that what Massachusetts, the, at the end of life, um, when people require nursing care, whatever, um, Medicaid, it's Medicaid, yeah, Medicare, I get this, but um, <sighs> what people are unable to, me Medicare puts a lien on people's homes. I think it's Medicaid. Medicaid, Medicaid. yeah, Medicaid puts, a, homes, yeah. Yeah, me Medicaid puts a lien on people's homes, and, um, and they're required to do so by federal law. But Massachusetts is one of the only states, there's, they said there was only two others, that puts liens not just on what is required by federal law, but many other categories of end of life expenses. Mm -hmm. And um, that is not required. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a huge shock for this family to, shortly after they buried their loved one, to get a bill for $177,000. Um, and, you know, and they talk about how it just perpetuates intergenerational poverty. Mm -hmm. um, but it does. Yeah. And, and, you know. Yeah, I'll check to see if there's legislation pending on this. I, I feel like there is, so I can check on it. Good. Set to give the most important things and not convolute. <laughs> so, <laughs> schools, schools, transportation, roads, roads yeah. the damn dam. Yeah, and of course the formula on chapter on 90. Chapter chapter 90. 90. Yeah. yeah, I've learned nothing from Phil in all my years serving as capacity beside him. Um, <laughs> is it the formula? It's fundamentally broken yeah. for a town like ours. Yeah. Um, well, I think you all have my cell. <laughs> 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 you know? uh, and I think you know, pretty accessible. So if anything else comes out up or if you want to have more detailed conversations about any of these things, uh, just reach out. We can set up time to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It was good to see yeah. you all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Brian, for always answering my texting calls. <laughs> <laughs> it was good to see you all. You all right. Okay. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. See you. Oh, did you want to Nick? What? Okay. All right. Um, so next, discussion and possible vote on the 120-day waiver request for proposed Commonwealth of Massachusetts DCR land acquisition on, for the benefit of town residents and Conway State Forest. So this is why you're here, Nick. Yes, so um, 
What would it be? Would you like me to kind of describe just the the process of it and what DCR is is asking for specifically? Or that sounds like a thoroughly logical place to start. Okay. Great. So um, basically, this is all about um, DCR trying to follow. Um, it's a uh, required set of regulations for whenever it completes uh, purchase of a particular piece of property in a particular community. So for any sale of land that DCR um, buys, um, there are two sets of notices and associated uh, waiting periods. So the first is the Department of Conservation is supposed to notify uh, public officials, so the select board, uh, the state rep, the state senator, and the regional planning board uh, that we are working to purchase uh, a particular piece of land. So that happened already. Uh, uh, DCR's attorney sent uh, the select board an email on February 26th. Um, and there is a 120 day waiting period associated with um, that notice. So basically we have to wait 120 days before we can close on the land transaction. Um, the second notice and waiting period is, uh, so uh, the select board or the city council of uh, the uh, affected community um, is supposed to announce that DCR is working towards uh, the purchase of that property at a public meeting like this one. Um, and there's a 60-day waiting period associated with that. And so that was the certificate of announcement uh, that was in that email uh, sent to you. Um, so that's all standard uh, procedure for any, for any DCR transaction. Um, <clears throat> the second thing we were asking in this case is uh, uh, we were asking uh, for a waiver for the 120 day waiting period uh, from the select board, uh, which would essentially allow DCR to close uh, sooner. And the reason we're asking for that um, is, is, you know, mainly to, you know, be um, uh, being responsive to the needs of the of the seller. Um, you know, because it's always nice when we can close sooner. Um, and, and in this particular case, it would, it would be helpful. Um, and then um, we are also getting close to the end of DCR's uh, fiscal year, um, so for, which is June thirtieth. So once if a project has to go into the next fiscal year, it just you know, it slows things down even further. So we just like to the, the waivers is you know basically to facilitate a sooner closing. Um, and I realized I probably should have introduced myself. Um, so I'm Nick Rossi. I am um, one of the people at DCR that works on protecting properties for conservation. Um, I'm somewhat new to my job. I've been on the job since last June, but I've been doing this kind of work for a while, um, and I mainly work in Hampton, Hampshire, and Franklin counties. Um, so did that all make sense? I know that was a lot yeah. of uh, that was a lot of stuff. It, it, it did. <laughs> so, so the, the, from the information you had sent to or had been sent to us, um, you know, I, I did do. You know, I, I was able to get a hold of the Conway Town Assessor who is out on uh, medical leave right now, but I did get uh, her to get my, my, because at the time this information came, the belief was that it was not under chapter 61. And, um, and you know, you alert us today that it was, and, um, and, and you know, and so, so my, th you know, my, my thing is how much revenue is, it's as part of the equation, part of the decision, or, Part of the enthusiasm level for this is how much revenue the town will be losing, losing. Um, and before these two par the, the two parcels combined before it went into chapter 61 
we're $2,800 a year in taxation revenue. Now, in Chapter 61, it's 740 something dollars a year. So this is a private rate. landowner who's wanting it, to It is a private landowner. And, and, and I know this, I, I spent a lot of time on this property. The former owner um, did, make, did maple, tap, maple there, and I actually was part of the maple tapping and maple boiling for like 10 straight years. It was, it was always a big social occasion there. Um, and a lot of people in town, when this got on the agenda, they immediately thought it was the par it was a neighboring parcel that had the falling down house and is and borders the entrance, the driving entrance into the, the state forest. A lot of us wish that this was that that was the parcel um, because that 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 yeah, um, but but. So, so it is this cha this parcel is these parcels are in Chapter sixty one, but um, was there was there ever a forestry plan that's because that's required for Chapter sixty one forestry? Um, it was it was it has to be a state approved forestry plan and there must be ten, ten years. It's kind of standard. yeah, but I believe there was it, it wasn't harvested that long ago. Right. Or there is rather. It was it was it was harvested um, a few years ago, I believe. Because, um, because it, and and it, it was preserved under forestry, and it would be still under forestry. So there's no roll. It, would there be a rollback a tax because it was within the time frame that there would be a tax rollback potentially if it was a change of use. Great question. So um, there wouldn't be rollback taxes because it would be staying in conservation. So the term would be staying as, 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 as open space. So there wouldn't be a change in use. And then that's kind of what I figured. Um, and then would the, would the town have a right of first refusal like normally when it comes out of chapter 61 within this time period? So another great question. And so it wouldn't be there. Would, the town wouldn't have a right of first refusal because again, um, okay. there's no change in use. So um, so it wouldn't be triggered. That's kind of what I figured as well. So those would be my two attempts to possibly raise revenue for the town. Um, um, and um, in case you haven't guessed, where this is this is high budget season for. A small towns like us, and this is a particularly grim budget season. Um, so, hence my questions. So, the um, yeah, um, and whoops. But basically, this is going to have no impact on town revenue. I mean, seven hundred and fifty dollars right, a year. So it's, it's, but a, it's a private piece of land that's being transferred to the state for the same purpose. But the, the state does give, do, does provide pilot payments, unlike, unlike the numerous private entities that acquire conservation easements and whatnot in town, like Franklin Land Trust, um, whose entire business model depends on hollowing out municipal revenue. Um, but <coughs> the, the, um, you know, so, so I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I know it, this is not Nick's fault by any means, but the state pilot payments are always uh, obscenely inadequate. <laughs> um, so th they are. Uh, this, but that's just because the places that are the most forested, like us, are also the most rural and um, with the least amount of votes. So. So we stand to lose around seven. Well, seven hundred fifty dollars in taxation, but we would gain state pilot payments for fifty acres or whatever it is right. total. So um, it, that would offset some of that seven hundred fifty, maybe most of it actually. But um, yeah, so but I mean, it is contiguous to the state forest. It would seem like a good. It makes sense. I mean, there's this little spot sense. here. That yeah, that little spot, that little spot there between it and the whole. And the rest. Yeah, that would be. Right. 
that would be really actually this just improved that property value a lot. Yeah, but exactly. Um, is this? Do we need to vote on this? Is this a well, it, we would be voting on whether to authorize the chair of the select board to sign the 120-day waiver. Okay. Yes, just the waiver. There's also the announcement, um, but that's that's not a vote. That's just kind of part of yeah. the and, the regs and that are announced. We, we, the, we sign the 120-day waiver, and then it's just 60 days. It's not like this is right. Is that what I understood? Correct. Yeah. So it's still 60 days. That's still two months. Right. It would have been 120 and then 60. Correct, Nick. They're not concurrent. Um, or are they no, concurrent? they run. They run concurrent. Oh, they are concurrent. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like it's a private party. I mean, it's. It is a. It is a private. You know, I know the circumstances of the sale. It may. Um, you know, it's it's the when when and just generally speaking, when children inherit property that they don't live in the area, and their only interaction with that property is the payment of property taxes. Mm -hmm. the, that that's that's how these things. That's how a seller in general like will, will tend to investigate these types of things. It's um, so it's. And honestly, we're lucky that they're doing it with the state instead of mm -hmm. a, a private entity, then, of which there are many, and they advertise aggressively for these types of properties. So, um, if it's, I mean, that just seems like a lot of bureaucracy. 120 days. I'm totally happy to cut whatever they can do in 120 days. Yeah, that's, I feel like we can do in 60, so I'm happy to cut that down. Yeah, um, that's just. It's obs obscure state laws. I don't yeah. think the people involved have anything to do with it except they got to follow them. Um, so, do you want to make a motion? So, or, I mean, sure. What would be the appropriate wording of the motion? Well, I, I mean, it has it written out. Actually, I wanted to ask you, Nick. It yeah. says on the announcement that the board's supposed to make clerk of the select board. Is it supposed to be clerk or chair? Can it be chair of the select board? Uh, yeah, it can, it can be chair, yeah. Okay. So do you need the chair to read that at this meeting, or just we enter it in the minutes? I believe people usually read, okay. they usually read the, um, the paragraph right before the, um, okay. uh, the certificate of announcement. All right. So um, this, is, this is an announcement pursuant to DCR number P-001053, the Town of Conway. I, Philip Cantor, the chair of the select board of the Town of Conway, Massachusetts, do hereby certify that on Monday, March 18th, 2024, it was announced at a public meeting of the select board that the Department of Conservation and Recreation is considering the acquisition of two parcels of land located in Conway, as shown on the attached, or on the on, on file, locus map that is marked as Exhibit A for conservation and or recreation purposes. Um, and then there would be a waiver statement. Right, so then you would vote to approve the 120 day waiver. Okay, so, so this would be, so the motion would be, a, this would be a motion that pursuant to 301 CMR 51.071B. Got that, Adam? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, Philip Cantor, Chair, hereby acknowledge that on Monday, March 18th, 2024, the Conway Select Board, um, when it votes to do so, agrees to waive the 120-day notice period as required by said section regarding two parcels of land located in Conway, as shown on the Locus map on file marked as Exhibit A for conservation and or recreation purposes in which the Department of Conservation and Recreation is considering acquiring an interest. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 
it's unanimous. So, did we good? Did we do good, Nick? <laughs> yeah, that was good. that was great. Thank you very much. All right, very good. Um, do we have anything else? Is that are we done with that? I think so. Okay. Um, but very nice to meet you, Nick. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. All right. Good night. Good night. Um, what do you want to do first? Go to any funds or events? Well, we've got Kendall and Kate here, so. Okay. Sounds like the bench is it. <laughs> um, Shoot, sorry. Um, discussion and vote on placement of the 40-year bench in Veterans Memorial Park. Um, Kate, you got any thoughts about this? Sorry. Um, you know, I think Kendall is probably the better person to speak to this because she's been more involved. So um, I'm going to see if she's able to say something. Uh, I'm here. I wasn't at the last select board meeting when this was discussed. Okay, Kendall. So, so a brief a brief synopsis in the Extreme Reader's Digest version is that the um, the Tim Fortier um, of the no what. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware, I'm aware of okay. all of it. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know what you're, you're voting today on with the, on okaying the placement of the bench. Well, he, 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 um, he wishes for no. We, 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 we said we would survey the stakeholders and decide on the placement last time. Um, and, and uh, Tim wishes for this decision to be made as soon as we can. So. Um, and last week we did hear from members of the Council of Aging that they would prefer it elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. that, that they liked it on either uh, on either the um, South River Meadow or possibly in um, in the uh, Town Common across from the former Masonic Lodge. And so the the problem with those is that. Well, the town common would increase our mowing contract expenses every year uh, because right now they can mow, and when they have to get off the lawnmower and weed whack, it the price for that service goes up for each little parcel that they do. So um, he also didn't want to transport it too far yeah, because it could crack. Yeah, and going up, yeah, would be going up a hill with a sketchy. Kind of a thing. Um, the the um, the and, and the same thing to add another bench. The 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 the, um, the highway department was not real keen on the one bench that was added, the first bench that went into South River Meadow, because that turned a former before with that whole meadow, all they ever needed was a lawnmower. Now they need to lug out the weed whackers too, and. Um, get off the lawnmower and weed whack around that bench, and they really don't want us to do that again. Um, so, I mean, the Council of Aging would probably prefer that we replace that existing bench with this bench, but um, it's already on a pedestal and it's sort of, it's not really feasible. And for the same reason, putting it in front of the town offices doesn't really work because again, that little square land is just something that they can zip through with their lawnmower on the way to mow something else and not have, which is, I don't even know if that's a separate budget item for the mowing contract because it takes them so little time. But if we make them get off the lawnmower, weed whack, then it becomes a thing. So, um, so the, for all those reasons, like we were kind of looking for a site for it that would not increase the town's ongoing annual permanent expenses. Uh, so that's why, you know, and, and I guess, I, I guess the, I know at least one of the four years liked the idea of keeping it close to where it was, but 
Yeah, I think I think the fact that it still would be angled to view the Christmas tree right. was a big selling point. And I did speak with Ron, and there's no issues with where the placement is that you have right there on Veterans Park. So, so that's kind of so you saw the map, Kendall. I, I sent the map to Veronica okay. to mark right. where we thought it should go. Okay, right. well, I'm just checking. I don't know. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, yeah. So I guess I guess the pollinator, the pollinate now committee is uh, in favor of this since they sent the map. Fair assumption. And yes, uh, it's it's really just to. To allow this bench to still serve as uh, to honor the fortiers and to put it somewhere near the Christmas tree would be nice, but we we don't have a strong feeling about where it goes. It would be great if if everyone was happy where it's relocated. Um, but uh, we just I had sent Veronique a few concerns about whether wherever it goes. Well, if it's if it goes across the street where if, where Ron okayed it, then Dig Safe should be called, and we're hoping that Tim will leave the site by the Christmas tree as clean as possible. Um, you know, just those are some factors, yeah. but it's really up to you about whether this this is yeah. a go. I like your I like the thought of doing something that can make everybody in the town happy. I, Wouldn't that be nice? I myself <laughs> think that there is no such thing in this universe that could actually make everybody happy. Maybe this will be the bench. Maybe it. Maybe maybe it's this bench on this spot. But yeah, um, yeah. One bench. We'll them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kendall had also raised uh, Festival of the Hills, and we heard back from them that they were fine with that, weren't? Didn't they? They did. Yeah. Sue McDonald. I'm, like I'm really yeah. glad, glad to hear that. I wondered about that. Um, so, are, is everybody okay with Yeah, it just looks great because you can see the tree. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, I think it's perfect. It's not that far. The original intent is honored, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, Chief Bates does know about it, so he'll be able to help. If it, we just need to get it right across 116. Right. Right. That and, and the bench itself is very highly visible from the road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It, it sounded like Tim was asking for assistance from the highway department. Is that something yeah, that? Yeah, he, he would like one person's assistant for an hour. Assistance. So that's, that's, assistance. Yeah, I think it's going to be really hard to move that bench. Yeah, but uh, but Erica did volunteer one of her children. Yeah, so, yes. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> she farms about as much as possible. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, so I'll make a motion to uh, approve, to, to the, approve the placement of the 40 year bench in Veterans Memorial Park in accordance with the map prepared by the Pollinate Now Committee. Um, which, what? what? Pollinate Conway. Pollinate Conway <laughs> Committee. Okay, sorry. Um, Seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So, all right. And then, Kendall, you were good with um, marking the spot, correct? Or somebody from? Yes. Yeah. Um, Kate and I are going to be there tomorrow between 3.30 and 5.30, and we can mark it then. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I think Tim said he was coming out the 2nd of <coughs> April. It was early. The 8th and 9th. The 8th and 9th of April. Yeah. So that is pretty soon. Yeah. Hopefully. So if anybody wants to... If anybody wants to come out between 3.30 and 5.30 and have an opinion about it, you're, you're welcome to right. join us then, as right. many of you. All right. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, discussion. Suggested uses of opioid settlement funds. Okay, <laughs> so um, yes. th this is a little bit, um, I I'm trying to get at the bottom of exactly what the regulations are for expending these funds. Um, and just to let you know too, we got 
emails today that this year's money had come in and then we got an email saying it came in too soon so just hang on it was like okay um, so I had contacted the state about this to try to get to the bottom of it and that's when I had that meeting with CARE Massachusetts and that's when they told me that technically we should probably have a five-year plan and that um, the select board is the final authority for deciding how the funds get spent although um, Mike Coachella, it, we're going to be putting an article on the warrant to move it from the fund it's in into a special revolving fund so that it doesn't have to go through any more. Anyway, so, and as I, I said, I think last week or the week before, the Board of Health is interested in the Narcan stations, and I've also talked with ambulance and um, fire and police about the AEDs. So I just kind of want to get to the bottom of exact I don't I don't want us to expend these funds and then find out that somebody somewhere is going to say no you didn't do that properly so I just want somebody to it, it sounds like 95 percent clear that we can go ahead and, and vote to do this but I think it did make sense to get the same AEDs that we already have so that all of the maintenance of those would be or the ambulance if they get a new one to upgrade them all to the same one but right. yes to make sure they're uniform I think that's what she said yeah but there's also a little bit of discrepancy I need to speak with the fur pug some more because they've been having conversations with the Board of Health about potentially um, using some of the funds in conjunction with the fur pug efforts so that will be a later conversation and there was some con you know the FERCOG was saying they didn't think that we could use it for AEDs, but I have something that says that we can, so this is why I'm just a little nervous. I want to be, I want to have something clear in writing that says you can do this before. So, is it, but it's just sitting in, a, in an account right now. Correct. That we're not touching. That we're not touching. And, and, and we're getting how much, like what's in there now and what can we expect 15000 right now, and we're getting payments over uh, 30 or 35 years. I think the total is only going to end up being about seventy-five or eighty thousand. It's not a huge amount of money. Um, so yeah. So these and are. And so who would put the restrictions on how we can spend that money? Would that be? That's the state. The However, state. yeah. So this is why, because I'm getting conflicting information. I just want to be a hundred percent sure before the board of health, and you know, I come before you and say these are the things we'd like to spend the money. Yeah, I guess the lobster dinner for all the whole town would be <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but, however, I mean, I, I mean, so we haven't spent any of this money yet, right? Correct. I just, I, I would like to see us, like, I mean, yes, it's, like, I understand why we're getting the money, but um, from the point of view of us being a very small town, if we have this pot of money, the fewer restrictions on the spending of it, the better. Because if it's to, you know, combat addiction, then like you could spend all that money on, <laughs> like, it doesn't have to be Narcan stations, it could be like, you know, right. community, like things that kind of right. promote, you know, health, well being in general. And that's, I mean, I, I personally, think that you know the Board of Health being the closest to knowing what the problems are who's been affected you know that kind of thing I personally would prefer to just go with Board of Health recommendations or how they feel that it should be spent um, to an extent yeah I mean I definitely like I want to take that into consideration but I feel like if this is yeah. money that's coming from like with relatively few strings attached Let's try it. Well, there are, no, that's the problem, is that there are definite, there's like seven or eight definite areas that you can right. spend the money on. So Let's not, you know, constrain ourselves to, let's keep it as open as possible. And, and, you know, I, I also thought of, about, you know, an actual um, opioid awareness talk to our sixth graders or something mm -hmm. that by someone that's actually really good at it, mm -hmm. which there aren't that many that are. Um, would be and also be like a use, a, a good use just within that education. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to see a breakdown of cost. Like I think the AADs, defibrillators is a great idea. They're not cheap. Um, no, they're we, live in a, each. we live in a town with many senior citizens. Our disease is prevalent. I think it'd be great to have universal AADs around so we could see how much it would cost to replace all the AEDs we currently have. 
and then um, all the Narcan stations. You know, Narcan for EMS, fire, police, of course, and then any of the stations the health department recommends and see where the budget is after that. And there are towns that are putting uh, a uh, Narcan dispenses, dispensers, like sort of like vending, free vending machine kind of thing. That, um, well, that's what they're talking yeah, 24 about. 24 seven access. Right. Yeah. We, yeah, we don't have 24-7, and the problem is that they're temperature sensitive. Mm -hmm. So that's why they wanted to place one in the town hall and then one up at the old highway garage. Um, but it would only be accessible during open hours. But the police fire ambulance, they already all have an Narcan. Right. So. Um, because I got, and I was, I, and I was told that now Narcan is now, by federal and state law, it is um, available over the counter. And it's supposed to be prominently sold at like every pharmacy and every grocery store and every convenience. They want it sold in gas stations and convenience stores that are the ones that are open 24 hours. And yet hardly any of them are selling them and the ones that do are keeping them locked, you know, with yes. with the with the nibs and every like next to the nibs and the with a So I guess part of my question too is if, if we can get the new AEDs and, and Narcan from this fund um, does that relieve some money from other funds, such as the police department, the EMS? Um, it would certainly help um, ambulance because, well, I mean, their their AED is working fine now, but this would be a budget item that they wouldn't have it expended on. And I know the yeah. police, um, they want one of the police cruiser, mm -hmm. um, so that would be you know, money that he wouldn't have to spend. That's what I would say, is to offer some relief to the other funds, to offer extra additional um, funding where, and wherever they think it needs to be spent, or we think it needs to be spent, to say. But that's what I would want to look into. What now, can we use to offset those other funds? Right, right. And then, you know, a, a huge part of this, like you had said, is gonna be community education and outreach. Um, so what's the best kind of plan going forward? What makes sense in a small town? Should, you know, monies be added to the fur club and see if there's a regional effort that we've become part of or does the town want to do it on its own? You know, those are all questions we'll have to grapple with. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I don't like. I don't want to <laughs> give more money. No more. I don't like. It. All right. So, so we did complete our new business, and it is almost seven o'clock. Um, so we can start our our finance committee meeting, like mm -hmm. time for the first time. Thank you. So I make a motion to call the finance committee meeting in order, jointly with the honorable select board of Conroe. Yes. Second. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. All right. I make a motion to approve the committee meeting minutes for the March 11th Finance Committee meeting as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Carry your hands. Thank you. On to the, on to the call. On to the uh, okay. Well, let's start with the, let's start with the department. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll go ahead. The way I had it listed anyway was um, yeah. The first one's personnel, since we have the personnel committee here. Oh, my goodness, does that mean you should? <laughs> I didn't even think about it because you're a quorum. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Call a meeting. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. A, it's no, we no, didn't, we didn't not, publish yeah. the meeting. Yeah, we did. Yeah. We did no, some we did. Yeah. not publish, so. We, yeah. yeah, all right. And so I can Notice for the record that the personnel committee is here. <laughs> and they're not talking about anything related to We're not personnel. deliberating, that's right. Yeah, we're not deliberating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you have to take a vote before bedtime? No. <laughs> 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 it does complicate. <laughs> um, so you want to you want to talk about the budget? Sure. The first thing the first thing you say though is the personnel committee is meeting tomorrow. We have a lot of items to cover, so I was going to propose that maybe we should be on the agenda for next week for select board, if select board would like to have a report. For budget or just for no, no, just no, general for activity. Personnel. Just general um, activity. I think that's great. I think following our meeting tomorrow we'll have a report to and recommendations to provide to you guys mm -hmm. for consideration. Um, and we need to get them to you before your next meeting posts. So um, but I think we can do that. 
Yes. As the chair. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, from what okay, I know so of some of the things you will be talking about, I am interested in those. Yes. <laughs> yes. Are, and you are obviously welcome and invited to tomorrow night. Thank you. Yes. Yes. It's I sent, I sent you the. It's a remote uh, meeting. Sent you yeah. the agenda. It's a, it's a Zoom meeting. So. No cookies. <laughs> 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 Bring it to a select board. So, personnel committee has one budget item for 2025. <coughs> it is $1,500, of which $1,195 of it would be used for a review of a revised personnel committee handbook by the Employers Association of New England. Through FERCOG. Through FERCOG, yes. And the rationale for doing this is the current personnel handbook is very old, has not been revised in several years. And to sort of get this publication off to a good start and have it be something that is useful to the town as well as the employees, we want to employ as much best practice as possible. So that's why Veronique proposed that we consider getting this, this edition of it reviewed by this organization, which is a specialty of theirs. Um, I don't see that, I was thinking about whether we would need this to be done on a regular basis and I don't actually see it that way. For this particular need it's because it hasn't been, um, it hasn't been revised since 2018. Formally revised, right? Formally right. revised since 2018. And was it ever reviewed, do we know, by any professional organization? Not that I'm aware Or is it just, it's just what the rules that... We know that the last commit personnel committee meeting prior to this was in January of 2018. So we're you know we're six years later. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so anything done, yeah. that we have is is six years out of date at this point. And we don't know that it's ever been reviewed by an HR professional uh, ever. I don't believe so. The previous chair of uh, the personnel committee was an HR professional at UMass. Okay. Okay, so we're probably so starting she, from a good place then. She did incredibly quit in disgust. Yeah. yeah. But we have found <laughs> in going through it. Um, that there are, I, I think it, it has been piecemealed a bit here and there, and there are now some conflicts that have been built into it. It just needs, mm -hmm. and then I think you might recall a couple of years ago, we took out some sections because it had been set up in the handbook, but then there was no forms or any kind of process to go with what was stated yeah. in the handbook, right. and it was like, well, let's get that first before we put it in right. the yeah. handbook. So. And it's unrealistic, I think, to expect the committee to do that kind of to have that. I mean, it's well, not going to be aware of best practice, right? That's exactly, right. right. So it's. I mean, this is the kind of thing. Organization. That, yeah, this is. It's worth. I feel like the investment. The, the only the only part about that is that the best practices have been by and large developed by much larger communities and larger towns and cities, um, and um, and we see this in other personnel contexts, like with the schools and everything, so that. The work product that you tend to get, and we get this from through in, in, with the school from the statewide organization. The work products that you get are sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I and, yeah, and, we're, and, we're aware and, of this. And, yeah. and, you know, and they they work well for cities that have thousands of employees, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and they're kind. They read like they mm -hmm. for that, right. but um, the provision of extensive procedural. And, substa and substantive rights that are not currently on offer um, really gums up the works sometimes. So. Yeah, and it, it does, but you know, at the same time, of course, uh, we don't want to fi find ourselves liable, liable for something. You know, the, the HR world is, is such a morass these days. And it's easy for us to so find, I, find ourselves. Where, where I was going with that is that, you know, that the product that you may get, feel free to edit it. <laughs> Oh yeah, we're, yeah. Well, well, this would okay. be, this would be other, a professional review. Right. The other thing too is, certainly myself as a committee chair is perfectly comfortable saying to this organization, this is what our expectation is with this review. Don't rip it apart and make it, treat it like we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're Newton, Amherst or yeah. Newton, Massachusetts. <laughs> you know, here's the context of what we have mm -hmm. and this is why we need the review. And to Veronique's point, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole set of procedures and forms and processes that have to be developed to support everything that's in that handbook, and that is still to be determined. Yeah. Yeah. And and none of this is reinventing the wheel, right? So right. Yeah. I so mean, it's just it's just like 
And I these think exist. ours will not be the first small town that Ian has worked with. Right. Either. Right. Yeah. yeah, I have to say it's been a huge relief to me to have yeah. access to Ian, and we now have at least four of us signed up in town that are able to access the HR hotline and their website and everything. And it's okay. just, it's just a big relief. And the other, the request is for fifteen hundred dollars. The rest of it would be if we had to specifically interact with town council. So that would only be on a case basis. So that may never happen. You know, we, we might not need to do that in 2025. Yeah, it's probably not a bad idea to run it by town council anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, being a town council of a lot of small towns mm -hmm. um, with a lot of HR experience. So. Talk fast. Town council's 150 an hour. You got 300 extra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I deal with, with my experience with outside council? Well, here's my list of stuff I want. Yeah, I yeah, want yeah, to address. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I control the agenda, not Turn you. The, they could be commuted to office too. Right. Right. So that's that's the All source. Right. Of, that's the source of our All request. Right. So this and, and, and this discussion, you know, Al Alan and Tom participated in this live at the meeting um, that about the impact of school choice on this budget and the, the sixth grade graduating class at Conway is uh, includes 14 kids that were school choice. So Conway's the the grammar the, the element our element is unique because we have um, just one teacher per grade and two age per teacher. So the costs to the town do not increase with more school choice kids. And every year there's way more school choice applicants than what we accept. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a desire to keep class sizes between 18 and 22 generally. That's the sweet spot, best practices, whatever. Um, so we're losing a class with 20 kids, 14 of, of whom are school choice. The, the incoming kindergarten class is 22 kids, 20 of whom are Conway residents. So in one sense, that's good, that's really good, because right. you get chapter 78, for, and, and the pre-K class already has, uh, what, 14, 15 Conway residents, so the, the it's future- It's nice to know that it, families are moving into Conway. Yeah. I, it is. <laughs> it is, yeah. yes. Because yes. I remember when my when I moved to Conway and I had a kid and I looked at because that's when they used to you know publish the a lot of information in the town report but I looked at the list of the kids that were born that year in town and I was like my God who is my kid going to go to kindergarten with you know it turns out there were a lot of school choice kids so yes I'd love to see that like <coughs> so that's could be the trending a few but. busy families <laughs> so but 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 because we're the outgoing sixth grade class. We're losing 14 school choice, incoming kindergarten, we're, there's two, there's 22 kids, two school choice. So we're losing 12, that's 50, that's $60,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, 
$60,000 is the difference between being under 3% mm -hmm. and, okay. and 4.64. So, so but this is without the transportation budget? Yeah, this is with it's the transportation budget. It's, yeah, it's, it's not, not broken down. down. Right. It's not yeah. broken down. It's not broken down okay. separately. So okay. what is the transportation budget then? But it when is, we see this 4.64, that includes? Yet. Okay. That includes at least 75,000 transportation? The, the transportation is over 100,000. Now we're we're significantly over a hundred thousand. It's you like hundred and twenty. Like, it's like a, it's something only twenty five like, would be if you added fifty thousand. Yeah, that's about what it is. Right? So right. even right. without right. transportation, we're still at almost five percent increase in operating. No, it has no, transportation. No. In yeah, it has transportation in, but the, but the exact precise number is not included. Okay. All right. So um, so so Phil, when did when do we typically find out about school choice options? The deadline for application is April first. <laughs> Um, so that, so no, that's just the automatic okay. default for the, um, so yeah, um, the deadline for application is, oh, is April 1st, for the but oh, the yeah, school committee is meeting March 28th <laughs> and we'll be know. voting the final that? budget then. The principal of the school thinks so she'll have a real go. good handle. Mm -hmm. Nobody waits to the last day to apply, yeah, it's yeah, the right. day before April yeah, or whatever, right, and right, okay. so um, she'll have a real good handle. We did. One of the people on the Zoom call at the public hearing was the kindergarten teacher, and we're, we were and who is Mr. Mr. B is a legend, um, and we all know yeah we, we yeah we, we know him and love him um, and uh, I mean I'm, yeah I mean he's he's, he's awesome he, he's, he's amazing he's and the so, reason people yeah, absolutely um, and and we. we um, so we, we flat out asked him, would he be comfortable with a few more? Because he's so well known that people move into the town to start kindergarten or, or send their kids to town to, the, to our school to, for, for, for him. Um, and he said he would, you know, he'd be okay with a, with a few more. So, um, and then there's a bunch of other grades that have relatively low numbers of school choice. And that it's okay to take a few more in each one. We. In the past, we've never really exerted pressure on the administration to say yes to a few more. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when you're taking a school choice kid from, a, these are all, most of them are from Greenfield. They're, they're from, like, neighboring. It really hurts the, the sending town. Yeah, yeah. Like, it really does. And we're, we try to be sensitive to that to some extent. Um, and, and some of our neighboring districts are really, you know, Pioneer and Mohawk. Um, you know, pioneers incoming ninth grade classes, right. like 15 kids. It's just, it's not, it's just, it's bad. Um, and so, and they're sending a ton of kids to Frontier and to Tommy Grammar. So it's not good for them, but, um, you know, this is, so, so the school committee did make a, an inquiry to the administration whether, you know, in the, in the school choice revolving, account which is the amount school choice pays mm -hmm. it's got 220 230,000 in it it is bad practice to spend current year school choice money you wait you a wait year debt that raises red flags to desi when you spend current year revolve okay. but we did ask the administrate the administration to assess all the variable moving parts and would they be comfortable with a $45,000 additional school choice um, so that the number would be brought down to below 3% annual increase mm -hmm. again. So that's, we'll see on March 28th. But I'm hopeful that, I, I know it'll come down. We don't know whether how, it'll come down how much. So that is the, that's the story of that. So we'll find out, April 1st is the, we the meeting April 1st, April 2nd? Uh, no. It's March 25th and then, yeah. April 1st. Yeah. April 1st. April 1st will know. I just wonder if at some point it might be worthwhile to, I know the finance committee is going to kind of do the presentation as far as, or capital improvements at least, and you know, investing in you know, infrastructure and trucks and like, equipment for the town. I, and I just, at some point, maybe we should think about like a presentation about the importance of investing in you know public schools. Um, 
for being important. I mean, I, I've always felt like that's very important to me. Like, I, like, you know, my kids are all out of public school, but it's very important to me that I live in a town that, like, people want to move to. I'm like, I'm so excited to hear that they're, like, you know, so many kids in the kindergarten you know, class. It, it's um, funny because the, the presentation at, um, at uh, town meeting for the superintendent and the school principal is so nerve wracking. Um, you know, you, 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 get, you get a sense of the room pretty quickly about where the room's at. And if you, if you have a good sense that the numbers you presented are acceptable to, to the town, the desire is just to be quiet. Because when you keep talking, you've got the possibility of saying something really <laughs> that could mm -hmm. that, that that could mess it up. Mm -hmm. So get it um, under. But, but under and, 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 and I have this I have this discussion with them all the time that you know you have to toot your own horn to some extent and you have to the long term you have to keep the vast percentage of the town that has no direct relationship with the school you have to keep them apprised of what's going on. Right, but and I guess my point is like even if you don't have a direct relationship with the school. You have an indirect relationship with the school. Right? Isn't, isn't, of, isn't uh, you know turnover in the town the driver of new growth? I mean, it, when, when your, your properties increase in value, you're selling to new families coming in. It is. You know, I mean, yeah, it drives taxes up too, but it, that's that's but the only driver of new there growth. There was a really good growth. Federal Reserve study that came out not that long. The Federal Reserve Board of Economists study that said if you have a high-performing local elementary school, it adds ten to fifteen percent to your property. Yeah. Well, we found that out last week. <laughs> well, right, yeah, but like sometimes it's good. That, I mean, you want your property. To right, <laughs> right, and then so you know. Our, our and you want to live in? I mean, I like I, I personally want to live in a town where people want to continue living in the town, generation after generation wants to continue living mm -hmm. in the town, and that's why I personally feel like absolutely invested in the school system because that's. Why else would people move here? Why else would young people move here? Well, I have <laughs> I have a different perspective. I don't have kids. Um, oh, I had enough. <laughs> uh, so, the way I see it, since being on the, these boards, is that we heavily scrutinize and penny pinch every single department, aside from the largest spending department that we have, because of the stigma behind it. And I understand it, and everybody wants a great school and great education, but I think a more focus needs to be paid attention to on the spending that is going on, because look at these increases, it's almost 13.5% over four years. So this is, that's, this is an excellent point, and the, one of the things about this is that um, the, the school committees are statutorily set up different than all other committees. They, school committees can actually issue their own debt. Um, they can, you know, they, 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 they are statutorily responsible for their own budget. And we can, at, on the floor of town meeting, we can lower it. But to do so on the floor of town meeting is like savagely irresponsible because by that point, the options for that the school actually has to reduce it is almost always like laying off staff, and um, what, that's why, to me, it's really important that like a select board member be part of the school committee, um, <laughs> yeah, wait, and, 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 and then and then get on the budget committee of the school, right. which is one rep, rep per town, mm -hmm. yeah. and um, and. You know, all I can tell you is that these things are really heavily scrutinized. We have a ton of meetings. I don't cut anybody a break ever um, on these things. And really? <laughs> <laughs> um, and and like, you know, I, I love the school. I wanted to support, but there's all kinds of stuff that I cut out in there too, all the time. Yeah. All, all kinds of things. All kind like the, you know, um, this 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 year they wanted for a specific academic program, they wanted a consultant, and when I looked into it and saw how much the consultant was charging, I, like, no. Well, here's, so, a, here's another things question. Like that. We, we um, had the, the wealth tax, right, that just got passed. Yes. Right, a lot of the savings, or the extra Fair income sure. of that, went towards the school, right? <laughs> there well, were free, free lunches, um, yes. what else? There, there were some other things that were uh, provisioned for the schools. Yes yet the budget is still increasing almost 5%. Because 
because we are, this is some, so, so lunch in particular, lunch, already we had two, we had three quarters of our students qualified for free lunch. Right. Anybody whose family is, uh, is mass health yeah. qualifies for a free lunch statutorily. So we were already, and this goes to the whole thing about how unfair it is the way that they Chapter, calculate yeah. the revenue mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, you know, what the town owes for doing and why you can't get in grant programs. Right. That we, when we have three, three quarters of residents that qualify for free lunches at school and yet we're considered a town as wealthy as Wellesley and, you know. Um, resort community. Resort yeah, community. yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but basically we were only getting lunch money from one quarter of the kids. Yeah. And the cost of administrating just the, the billing and the, all that was just like two hours, whatever, two or three hours per week. For, basically, those things like wash out. And yeah. Um, yeah. We, the, the lunch money actually does not, the lunch program does not usually cost us anything, it's, which it should. The, the, the federal reimbursement for, which is USDA for lunches, um, has, if it, when it was started in 1976, if it just kept up with inflation, it would be something like $15 per lunch. We still get like $3 per lunch from them. And we ask, you know, we're really lucky that we have an incredibly talented like lunch crew, with actual like professional caterers making the food every day. Um, because that's what they do in their, it's their side business. Um, yeah, they start the, the budget the, for sure. They, they, the, what they do with, and by just making homemade stuff um, is just incredible. And, you know, um, but that is, we should be getting more money we, from all of these state things that they keep promising. It always flows towards the 17 districts in the state where English is a, you know, English is a second language, where there's huge homeless student populations, et cetera, et cetera. And they need that. but. We're, we get left behind, and that's why, that's one of the things I beat up on Natalie about all the time. Just, you know, we need our fair share, and we're not getting it. So, it, these are all correct issues, I mean, but um, as a local school committee, I don't, or as a select board, I don't know what we can do to solve them. And it is, it, the rate of growth is unsustainable. It has been since the 1970s. The, it, it's, you know, I, Alan brought up the point where, like, what was the year at, at the meeting? What was the year where school, where the state reimbursement was, like, you had a, you had a fact thing that state yeah. reimbursement in, like, 1980 was, like, 40 percent, and now it's... Yeah, 2003, 1.125 million, now it's about 1.3 million, 2023. That's 20 20 years later. Yeah. Yeah, but there's, and it's just... Level. But there's no city in town in Massachusetts is at the level of funding that they were at, dollar for dollar, right. since 03. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so the, 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 it really is the, the, the lack of state support well, for our schools really is support. sort of the alpha and the omega of our problem. Yeah. Well, okay. and it's the lack of federal support. What's a quarter of the state's budget? <laughs> yeah. What's a quarter of the state's budget? <laughs> the Mass Health. Yeah. One quarter. Yeah, uh, and they just LPL? cut two hundred million out of that. You know, like there's <laughs> only so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's. It, yeah. yeah. Going forward, I mean, the discussion was about the ESSA grant not not go, uh, going away, and uh, rolling schools yeah. being an issue for fiscal year twenty six. So, my question would be, uh, would the uh, school committee in the coming year? Consider other alternatives. I'm <clears throat> looking at the uh, possible paying of school bus transportation by parents since we're transporting 41 kids. Of uh, families opting in to pay for uh, for busing, some sliding scale amount. Uh, you know that that was brought up. Um, I don't know what the appetite for something like that is. And um, you know we had that in Westwood the year we moved there. What was it? Six hundred dollars a year. Something it like changed, that. it changed. But what ends up happening is parents start driving their kids to school. Yeah. That's reality, that's what they'll do. Yeah. Yeah. And and the other thing is that um, what 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 hurts us is the decision by parents to go when when you assess extra fees, there are so many families right at the margin mm -hmm. 
that it pushes them into homeschool or into charter or private or whatever, and then we lose much more than we gain from that type of program. So, um, I might be right around here if they go to charter school, that means we're paying a lot of money to transportation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so, but, but, but homes, homeschool in particular is really, um, those, those numbers went up during COVID, right. yeah. and they're coming back down, but that is something mm -hmm. that, you know, Those numbers went up in town? In, a, in all, every no, town I'm in like the, the country. This town. Yeah, those numbers went up because of COVID. Mm -hmm. because, it, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of different reasons. So the huge, the, that one year when everybody, when nobody could enough. stay employed that one year, and the town unemployment level hit record highs. Well, I, like I asked the superintendent at the meeting, how many of the buses end up getting here and they're not even half full? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I went right. to, that's, that's without a charge. Yeah. I, I went to Frontier and I used to go take the bus uh, to school every uh, in middle school, and then once I got to high school, my mom and dad drove me to and from school every day. Yeah. And and, uh, but, and and there's a lot of parents that are not fortunate enough to be able to do that. Sure. Mm -hmm. And you know, so so th it ends up being that busing serves, generally speaking, the least financially blessed among us mm -hmm. and that when you put fees on that that's really who you're putting fees on oh, yeah. Yeah, um, it should be the other way around we should charge money for double parking in front of the school <laughs> and encourage people to use the buses um but Extra yeah credit for walking. <laughs> yeah right yeah. right right yeah. so the i don't know there, there's there's a lot of smart people that try to figure this stuff out and you're welcome to take my spot on the school committee. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, but I, it's these are these are tough issues, and this, the the increase rate is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. It is the state's fault, but that doesn't take you very far at town meeting when you still got to support your school or get persuade your community to support your school. In the school interventionist position, that included in this budget. Yeah. How much is that? Take like seventy five thousand or something? I'm not I can't I I don't remember precisely that number. I think that's what it that's like ballpark because it's a PhD so, but they they do the the report is that that it, um is a really it, they don't want to part with that position because they credit that position for Conway's test scores in the past two years, like shooting up to the very top of the state. Um, and not just like the MCAS, there's a test that is giving world, worldwide, the NWEA, that it's how you, it's, you can compare you to every other state and every other country, and it's the one that says that if Massachusetts was a country, we would have the second or third best schools in the country, in, in the world. Um, um, but we're, we're far and above the, the best performing state in education in the country. I feel like the grammar schools, I remember that test when my kids were there. Like the grammar school's always been a very high performing school, like for years. Have the other town, yeah. Sunderland and uh, Whiteley and Deerfield didn't do it. Still haven't uh, included a school interventionist in their budgets, right, for the grammar school? Um, I know Whiteley's looking at it. <coughs> yeah, Whiteley's looking at it, and I think Sunderland is doing something part, uh, part there's time. Yeah, and I mean, Deerfield has been talking about it too because there's a large segment of the student population that's not really recovered from the long-term absences that they've had. Mm -hmm. And that's really the purpose of the interventionist. Um, and we're still, we're still at that, but there's, um, and absences are, are, are trickling up again. And, but there, there's, uh, yeah, the, the number of the, 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 the Conway kids that are doing reading and math like at or above grade levels are, are just astonishingly high compared to the state averages. How about to the other, the, to white me some of them in there for like, yeah, we have increased the bonds over and above there since the... Uh, yeah, we've been the gold standard in this right. district for a number of years. And we're, we're, we've separated ourselves from the pack even more. Which is part of the reason that Toronto is an attractive place to move to yeah. and like raise your kids, yeah. you know? Because 
I mean, the number of kids just from those three towns yeah. that, that tried the school choice into Conway Grammar is pretty, is pretty astonishing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, there's a frontier budget. We did run through that. Um, Franklin Tech will be here next week to mm -hmm. give their presentation. But I did want to show you this because as of, as of today, um, we don't have anybody signed up to attend Smith Vocational. So that would that's huge. That would be a nice <laughs> chunk of savings if that does. And that that application deadline has passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but Franklin Tech. So you know that's that's always a scary thing. We, that those numbers oscillate so yeah, much. I heard bigger. our numbers aren't aren't so bad. Um, because I was talking to John, one of the board members, um, there. Who lives in town? And, uh, he said, uh, "Yeah, their budget's increasing, but he said Conway." This is just anecdotal. So yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, you know. What What we do know is that there, uh, I do know from um, other school committee, from other select board members that have, they've already done their. We're like the last in their in our area. Yeah. So it's the yeah. presentation thing is uh, runs to our towns, the warrants are closed already, etc. Yeah. Um, they're. Cost per pupil is now twenty seven and a half thousand. Our cost per pupil is seventeen and a half thousand. For and so, Yeah. So you know, it's at the point where it is um, you know, it's in our best interest as a community to dissuade kids from going there. Um, and and one of the things that Frontier has done, if you were you were at that meeting, they got those three hundred thousand dollars in grants to set up these programs that are vocationally oriented, um, the computer assisted drawing stuff mm -hmm. and um, every vet tech stuff, all these things that kids used to go to Franklin Tech for are now being offered um, with some of the same instructors at, front, at Frontier. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's- You know, the vet tech program has been a real home run for Franklin Tech in high school and kids get turned away. Yeah, so they had their first uh, they had the first job placement or internship placement for a tenth grader in a local veterinary thing. They were all happy about that. So, so but that's yeah, they, they're trying to do things. But my thing is that we Frontier still ha takes a day out of their 180 days to allow Franklin Tech to come in and do informational assemblies and recruit from our students and. And I, I just, and um, I'm trying to put a stop to that. So I just am. It's just sorry when you it, when your costs exceed ours by ten thousand dollars, and you take that much revenue from our town, um, you're no longer in the town's best interest. You might be in the individual family or child child's best interest, but um, I don't know about that. I just know about the town's best interest. So. Um I thought somebody was going to be here from the Council on Aging, but um, they did put in a request for more funding, and as I understand it, it's for another foot clinic. Sure. Okay. So I was asked to speak about this too. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, um, yeah. So because I'm doing the I'm um, the select board rep to the mass in motion thing, and I'm, I'm the one that the Council of Aging likes to beat up on. Favorite punching back but um, the, they so as you can see their budget has been absolutely flat yep. forever um, and uh, as we were contemplating whether or not to join as a town the South County Senior Center which the fee for the con for the town of Conway would have been 32,000 had we done that this year and we look at how much we're actually spending now um, <laughs> um, and you know there's more that they can do there's more that they want to do the foot clinic is almost always sold out it is not o open only to seniors it is open to town seniors get first dibs 
but um, I've gone there twice for foot massages. It's great. So, <laughs> it's, sorry, it's 30, 30 bucks for like a serious professional nursing foot massage, man. Um, now I'll never be able to get an appointment with that. But, um, but, they, had, they had pedicures on there. Don't give me any ideas, but, uh, but um, um, yeah, so, so they're, it's a, it's a really good program. They're, they're sold out usually, I think. Um, and they believe that they could easily fill up another one, especially if I keep doing free advertising like that. But no, like. So this is this this budget is just literally reflective of an extra foot clinic. Of an extra foot clinic, and they think they might be able to have the um, the nurse here for more hours as well. And she's always oversubscribed as well. And mm -hmm. it's really good that we have that county. First of all, she's awesome, but um, Meg Meg Ryan is awesome. Um, and the other and if she's here for more hours, then she can see more yeah. seniors. And um, being so being so far from medical services, that makes that service really useful. So um, I told them that I would support this. I told them that I was only one vote among many. But, um, <laughs> you know, but that it this seems like, you know, even though this is a really crappy budget year, this is something that senior citizens are, <coughs> out of our population of almost 1,800, senior citizens are 760 of us. And all that we pay, all that we do for them every year is twelve hundred dollars. Like, so, and, and we and we ask them to support everything else because our the demographics of who attends town meeting skews towards seniors. So, yeah, yeah. colas, mm -hmm. colas. Yeah, that's next on that. Well. Um, it's just something to think about. I didn't really want to get too far into this discussion because there's still moving parts to the budget itself that we don't right. understand. This and is way easier to support than the increase in the elementary school. <laughs> Not really. There's a this huge difference. Is way there's a big, there's big differences. So, and then the other thing too is um, this was brought up to me by a town department head who wishes to be anonymous, remain anonymous, that this year there were some departments that submitted budgets that included mm -hmm. salary raises as part of their budget. Mm -hmm. There were other budgets that didn't really know that that was okay because it never used to be okay. And that in the past, I remember this came up a couple years ago when the town clerks, I believe it was, submitted a budget with wages, increased wages as part of that budget. And I, I, um, I was reminded that there was a belief that we had voted to, to instruct departments not to do that anymore, that to make a note in their budget request that these are the salary requests that they're making, but to not actually include them. And that would we be better off looking at the various town budgets as a whole with clean budgets, and when we're considering COLA to include, to also consider all of the salary requests um, as one, clean, transparent um, thing rather than the way it is now, um, which could be argued that it lacks trans as much transparency as we could bring to bear on the subject. Mm -hmm. um, well, just to speak to that, since I was the one who agreed to put them in there, <coughs> it was contingent on being reviewed by the board and the personnel and committee. the personnel committee I'm, I'm and that those would be recommendations and I if there was a vote that was before I was here um, and there have been people who have put in and asked for races before so I don't think it's an unusual think, year for that I think the best practice though is to put in just clean operating budget requests with notes at the bottom of that request and then to just do all of the salary requests and the call because to the extent that you give, once you determine what the acceptable pool of amount for money for wages is, yeah. wage increases is, then it becomes, uh, uh, then there's, you know, you, you can more equitably discuss what's fair to, to all employees and um, et cetera. But once there's some. Oh, what on earth are you talking about? Yeah. We've not been idle. I haven't been <laughs> idle. <laughs> 40 minutes. Um, that is ridiculous. Well, that's right. So sorry. 
It's all right, I'm still recording. It's still recording, but, oh yeah, there was nobody else oh, in there. Right. Oh, right. Um, I, I, so, so I get that. Lori was on there, but uh, was she? Just, oh, was she still on? Um, I mean, she hasn't spoken yet. Yeah, yet. Well, well, on Earth, it all went away, too. Uh, wow. if, you, if you launch, uh, do you have Zoom on your laptop? No, I'm not going to give you feedback right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, we, we've had issues with Zoom. But what I wanted to say to that is that there's, there's two parts to that. One is deciding on the pot of money that you have to give colas. And the other is making sure that the positions are paid according to what the position should be paid. And I think those should be kept as two so you, separate I, issues. I, I, no. I agree, but I also feel like if we were to look at what the position should actually be paid, we wouldn't be able to afford to pay any and, of these And, and I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't actually, I, I don't agree with the idea that we are underpaying people. I don't. I, I, in order to agree to that, you have to believe that we are part of the hiring pool of existing professionals in those positions. We are not. We never have been. We are the first job for people that uh, wish to ascend to those positions. This is true across the board. Um, every single one of our highest paid professional positions, superintendent, director of business administration, curriculum director in the schools, um, um, uh, town administrator, police chief, fire chief, every single highway boss, every single one of our highest paid positions, this was, this is their first job in this position. So that's why we shouldn't be competitive? So, so, it, uh, it, those people that wish for this to be a career path, um, Ten, in, in this town's history, after a, a number of years, they seek out higher pay. And we're never going to be able to compete with our neighboring towns with much larger populations. You know, I think and we're going to have a lot of the same conversation next week. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I don't want to really, you know, shoot everything off right now. Let's, let's, let's. And, and when you look at sort of what people were, what position, what, what, the salary was that people when people first started their their employment have their have their has the annual increase in compensation been fair? Yes. I, I think the question on the table is though, what is the process we're going to follow? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The first question is the budgeting process. So do you want to budget without any salary changes like from last year? Is, is so that's what you're advocating for. So uh, no, that's what I, I'm understanding. No, there. Uh, I, I mean. <laughs> I, I think that the budget process works best when the operating, but it, when it's most transparent. The most transparent way to do it is when clean operating, clean budgets, department budgets are presented without sa individual salary requests. So would that that would mean um, though taking like the salary line out of all departments? No, no, no. The, it, the salary line would be flat from last year. Right. Yeah. And then, okay. then with, you want to have a note on the budget that says we are making a request to increase right. these salaries. And then when we positions. sit down and look at salary increases in, to include COLA, we do all of them in a coherent way, it, rather, rather than like right now having a discussion about COLA when there's big missing chunks of Yeah, I, I, I agree that, yeah. that it, it complicates mm -hmm. things to talk about single positions here and there. Right. Um, but, it's, but we just need a process. We, we need, need a like process. A, yeah. and, 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 that's, and, and now I, we have a committee. And I think, I, to me, the process is cleanest and most transparent when you just keep salary increases out of the departmental budget requests, like the actual numbers, just stick a note on it and we'll decide and make your pitch. And also, when you're here talking about it, make yeah. your pitch. Yeah. But we'll, and, and we'll, when it's time to decide right. on salary, we'll decide those things in a global, yeah. all-encompassing way, rather than piecemeal. I don't have. A, I don't have. I just. I, I don't know how that. But how does that affect like contract negotiations, where people come in specifically with like this is. Well, that means that the budget process is 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 uh, co coincident with the uh, 
salary, any, any salary negotiations, right? And, uh, and you have salary negotiations as part of contract, individual contract negotiations should take place after the budget is already pre presented as well. After COLA. After COLA. Correct. I um, agree. Totally, totally agree. And that, yeah, because it's all, all these moving parts are related to each other. Mm -hmm. And it's, it works best when they're all considered in a way that acknowledges that. Mm -hmm. So for next week, I will take out any salary increase that was put in there and make sure it was all level with last year so that you'll have a clean. No, we agree. Yeah. 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 And salaries, then we can take a look at the wage because a lot of the COLA, especially, is impacting on wages. Sure. And yeah, so I feel like I'm talking about it. I'm sorry. What's your turn? What else do we have? Let's <laughs> I, I feel like we had the preliminary call the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to uh, adjourn? Uh, anything else you want to discuss? My thought would be uh, for next week, you want to talk about COLA, but also uh, you want to take a look at, so you're going to present the new budget, Monique, in terms of keeping so, the uh, salaried employees that are non-school at, at level fund and then take a look at the impact. What, what do you, what do yes, you want to do? Yes, yes, I'll put that together for, yes. So, but just, just to your point, Alan, I think, March 28th is going to be the final piece of our budget when we're going to have, well, I'm sorry, April 1st, when we're going to have the school. Next uh -huh. week, we're going to have the uh, tech. The, the tech. Those yeah. are the two big missing pieces to yeah. our budget right now. Right. Once we have that information, then I think it, we're, the number, everything's going to fall into place where we can make take the most look informed at decisions. And take a look at maybe individual wage increases for the salary, salary increases for the salary employees. There were only two. So, yeah. um, and one of them was just thrown in there as, you know, a placeholder for, so that's easy enough for me to take out and just okay. have a note on the side. And right. then you will see on the tab that says Article 2, everything will be there and you'll be able to see by department, right. you know, all the changes. Okay. So I'll have that for next week. Thank you. Is that it? That's it. Can we make a motion to adjourn the Finance Committee? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for thank you the links. Items not anticipated for eight hours. Town administrator update. We read everything. Do you add anything to that? I just wanted to state that um, I did put in a request for the board to consider a stipend for Ron. So I just wanted to put that on the record that I've made that request to go on the agenda at some point. I, yeah. And um, this is for. I'll put on record I'm in favor of it. I would like to put on record too um, that, I, that, like, I didn't realize what that number was. I mean, we talked in the past, all of us, about like possible compensation for his overtime. That number came in way less than I thought it was going to be. Um, so I, I'm in favor of, um, of a retroactive payment and uh, for Ron for all of. The work that he's done above and beyond. Well, we have to be careful on that. I'm <laughs> grateful for all that. I'm grateful for all that. I am very much opposed. I am very much opposed to that, and I am not inclined to put that on and the he's agenda not, so anytime it soon. It might not go anywhere so, because um, Phil is not going to put it on the agenda. But I um, am in so favor. And I there was I think um, lots of us. Lot. I think it is our job to save the town money. All of us. Like, uh, the, the amount of money I save the town every year is amazing. The amount of money Veronique saves the money town every year is amazing. None of us keep score and ask for such raises afterwards to compensate us for I, that. I just want to say before we discuss it anymore, on a legal front, you can't state that you're giving somebody money for work done that they weren't paid for. It has to be a um, it has to be a um, performance based decision. Hmm. I'm not sure. It's definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> you spoke to town council? Okay. Well, you might want to ask her, but I know in the corporate world you cannot do Right, that. but that's different because I have spoken with a, a number of different people. Just for folks at home. Bill's not putting it on the agenda anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I yeah. I think it's worth clarifying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I there's the, the word stipend was used. Um, and it's been done in quite a few municipalities right. for, so I don't think there's any issue whatsoever. And just so people know, this money would not come from taxpayers um, in 
Conway residence, it would be part of the $1.245 million that was given to the town. Right. So that does sound like a performance bonus, yeah. which would be totally acceptable. Mm, it's not me. a performance bonus. No, it's, it's a stipend. Okay, whatever, whatever we call it, I'm okay with yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's okay with it. Um, yeah. I had two. Oh, yeah, so I had a question. <coughs> The, uh, not so much about your. Um, can I just go get like word comments? Yes, I'm of course. Um, so I so the the Colonnade Conway there, um, the downspout at the town hall or town offices, right? I'm s still a little bit confused about that. <laughs> like exactly what are they are they asking? Do you know? Like do they just want to attach a. a Thing. I, I, I wasn't totally clear oh, for, whether for a rain garden there, right? So well, they, I, I mean, like they do. They I want, want to, right? So, yeah. so is that is that something they? Can, it sounds like they're concerned about like the foundation of the building being you know destroyed mm -hmm. by water coming down, which is so. Are they proposing this as a solution to that? They they also have wanted to take over that garden the, the, the garden that the landscape people put up with plants to fall from the truck um, right. or, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so if you're talking about the the project that we're trying to look at right now yeah that's so that's part of the current MVP grant that there is ten thousand dollars set aside to do a K through six demonstration rain garden if we could find a spot to do it they wanted to try potentially up at the grammar school, but there really isn't a place for it there. Um, and, and so um, I had reached out to um, Open Space and Pollinate Conway to see if there was another spot in town that would work for a very quick turnaround on a rain garden. And did let them know that you know we're working on another MVP grant, which will have other possibilities in the future. But this one has to be completed by June 30th. Right. It sounds like they still have like continuing concerns. Like they just want to. Is that? I don't like, know. I, I spoke with Ron, and he said there's no water issues okay, in that so, building. So, all right, so that's not. I don't. There are water issues, issues in this building. Right, okay, no, the, so, the corner so, of that building. There's definitely water issues. I mean that the 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 downspout's not long enough. The downspout's not long enough right. off the water. The water, it is a damp, moldy basement because of other reasons too, but that obviously is a problem, just walking by there and looking at it. Yeah, you know, so I'm just, it's I'm just obviously wondering if that's a problem. Like, if, if they're willing to put a quick fix on it, they like, are. It, like they just want to... Yeah, there's mortar missing from the corner. Yeah, yeah. is there, is there yeah. something well, we could do that, with that? But that's not a rain garden, so I'm No, not, I know, yeah. I know, but, want, but apart from that, it. it seems like they're just concerned about like, what's happening to the corner of that building yeah. and is that something that we can like but, prioritize like and they wanted to garden certainly they wanted to garden to. that lawn and when they proposed that to us a couple of years ago we said we got to do the that the, the handicap walkway. walkway first right the, the walkway is done right. and they they wanted to talk about doing that but even but, but whether whether the you know redirecting that spout is part of a rain garden or not is that something that we should be doing just to you know alleviate people's concerns that the building's going to crumble i mean that's, that's <laughs> the just the building will crumble know, but right? it is causing a constant issue that's it would be an easy <laughs> fix if they put a rain barrel right, right right exactly yeah so that's, yeah so, yeah. so that and then uh, two other questions um which i what delavar avenue which i know is just on the list of projects that are going to be done um we just haven't had highway department has been under staff and and there's been other issues um, with other rain events in town. Um, and then an update on um, Bardwell's Ferry Bridge because because okay, people they were like, oh, mass dots in town, which I know that's not a mass dot thing technically. Like that's but yeah, but it, but it, it wasn't a stop on their little road <laughs> on their road show. And right. that's um, that's something that people have been asking me about. Okay, so Delabar, so, yes, it's definitely still on the list for this year. Obviously, we were supposed to get done last right, year. Right, yeah. That's nice um, <laughs> so hoping yeah. to work on that or get started on that very soon. They haven't finished, they haven't awarded the design part of it yet, though. Delabar? Where did no, the, go? The, the, the Bartles Ferry Bridge. Oh, Bartles Ferry. Oh, yeah. I'm talking yeah, about yeah. Delabar. Yeah, Delabar first. <laughs> yeah. That's just, that's I'm what like, I thought. Wait a minute, it's yeah. been designed for years. Delabar is just a matter of like, getting to it after like it would have been done if we hadn't had all the 
brain damage in July. And right, right, right. 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 So, right. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, Same thing with the transfer station. Phase. Right. Um, yeah. But Bardwell's Ferry. Bardwell's Ferry. That's the last I heard was the official letter we got that we were, you know, on the list, and that that's pretty much it. Oh boy, is there on a list. I know. Is there? <laughs> um, and I did speak with DOT town council, and Ron and I met with um, DOT to talk about the replacement bridge, the permanent bridge that's going in on North Poland. Mm -hmm. And I asked about Bardwell's Ferry, and they were like, "Oh, it's not on my docket yet, so I can I can follow up some more." Um, or if I there's, it's a couple years if it's out. helpful for, I mean, maybe a couple Steve. years down the road, but that one, I mean, I don't know. If there's anything that we can do, like people that we can call, <laughs> any help that we can provide to uh, expedite. I'm not sure they realize just how much slower our state police response is and, mm -hmm. and how much they are the primary backup well, for our town at night. But I mean, that's just like, I, I mean, that was like one of my regular go-tos to I mean, there's, there are other ways to get out of Conway, obviously, but that was a very... I mean, we should team up with Shelburne and Butler. Yeah. Because it's effective. Yeah, them too. I mean, that's 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 a high-traffic um, area that it's really, especially with this summer. We discussed that with at the MEMA meeting and about how, you know, when if it comes to an evacuation route, that was one of our right. main yeah. things out. So I could, um, if you like, reach out to Shelburne and Buckland and see if they wanted to do a joint letter to try to push it forward. Yes. Yeah, yeah anything okay. that we can do to um, get that road back open. Because let's face it, they would benefit more from it. easier access to us than we would to them. But. <laughs> <laughs> so what, pizza at the end? Uh, it just a reminder that we got to put the frontier uh, for next week. The E and D access and disability stuff oh, yeah. for frontier. Yeah. You got to have a vote on that. So you said that I know that the rain events pushed the transfer station um, repavement, but that's still on the books, right? For this year. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because they're getting worse. <laughs> oh, I, I know. It's yeah. It's a definite hazard, but. Yeah, but we're still not done with all the roads that we're doing. Right, yeah. um, so, you know, <laughs> we're down people and it's, yep. yeah. Doing the best we can. Yeah. <laughs> yep. For sure. Next year will be better. <laughs> bless you. Bless you. A noble thought. Next year in Jerusalem, right? There you go. <laughs> That's almost Passover. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. All right, so, um, is there anything else we have to talk about? No. Too bad. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.